Thank you for joining me. I want to first ask about the title of your presentation was We Are the Human Medicine, Human Development and Child Being in an Era of Ordinary Magic. Mm -hmm. So first, what we are the medicine. What do you mean by that? Well, we are the medicine is really just saying that our development throughout early life, all throughout life, has a lot to do with relationships and the safety and stability and nurturing qualities of those relationships. So we have the power within us as individuals to... Yes, between us and within us. So mm -hmm. we are the medicine is both about with between us and the importance of relationship and then our own relationship with ourselves and how we're making meaning of our experience and able to actually change and transform ourselves, which of course brain plasticity and the sciences are showing is very possible. So it's really a holistic term to grab both of those pieces of the importance of relationship and connection to early life and all throughout life and also the power that we have to actually turn our attention toward ourselves and change ourselves in ways that can help us thrive. So when you come to a conference of basic scientists, translational scientists, uh -huh. and you talk about holistic, you're adding something much different and much richer and deeper to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. I mean, I think that what lives within and between us really is what everyone, all the sciences, if you read the science, and our last speaker was just saying that, actually, it's about love. You know, I mean, he just came out right and said it. And you unbundle that and look at what the qualities are around the capacity to care for one another, have empathy, be engaged, listen. All of these are the kinds of things that when they occur, we thrive. And when they don't occur, our neurobiology and our biology and even our microbiome go haywire. Mm -hmm. So restoring those capacities is an important part of restoring health and thriving. The second thing I wanted to ask about was the second part of your title is um, human development and child well-being right. in an era of ordinary magic. Yeah. I'm intrigued by the words ordinary, ordinary magic. Ordinary magic, yeah. Well, ordinary magic really refers to the fact that what we need to be well is actually in many ways very ordinary. It's about safe, stable, nurturing relationships, awareness and intentionality about our own lives and being having health goals and pursuing them and knowing we can change. These are ordinary concepts. And resilience actually is promoted for children who have had trauma and adverse childhood experiences that can lead to trauma um, is ordinary. It's about how they're interacted with and how they then are taught to interact with themselves in order to heal the way that trauma has affected their nervous systems and their own perception of self. And so if you look at what actually we know about resilience and healing, it's very, it sounds very ordinary because it's about you and me and me and me and how I think and feel and the way I navigate that. And so it's not necessarily high tech, it, but it's very um, sort of I call it the inner and relational pharmacy. And you know that relational wounding requires relational healing. And when we talk about that, it's about ordinary everyday things that we take for granted. And in many ways, we, I think, to really take it for granted too much because it often doesn't happen. And I think we think if it doesn't happen um, or that it is happening when it's not happening or we don't really realize that we actually are not a society that has prioritized relationship and families in many ways by the policies that we have. And really, you know, this sort of American spirit of individualism even makes it scary to be vulnerable and, and really acknowledge we need each other. And we need each other in ways that are really healthy for us. I'm not talking about dependency and not being independent, but if we don't have those relationships in our lives, 75-year-old study that just came out that shows the most important thing to happiness and well-being when you're 75 is your relationships throughout life. So we know these things, and how do we operationalize it? Now, it also struck me the prevalence of childhood trauma yeah. it is just astronomical. I yeah. mean, one wouldn't think the numbers that you presented were pretty astounding. Yeah, they were, and I was surprised too. You know, we took a long time to identify only nine of you know, many types of adverse childhood experiences that had enough evidence linking them to poor outcomes. So all of the ones that we measure do have enough literature to show that those children exposed to them leads to poor health outcomes and well-being. 
And so it was half of children experiencing one or more. And it's the accumulation that really is the issue. And so with two or more, we start to see very big effects. And I'm not sure what it would have been in the past, because we haven't measured it. This is the first time. But I do know that from the adult studies, when people look back on their lives and report some of the same kinds of things, that we see repeatedly with hundreds of articles at this point, that adults reporting their experience in childhood, those that report these kinds of experiences, are much more likely to have a heart attack, to have cancer, to have certainly substance abuse, depression, and it's, it's after adjusting for everything we can. And so these studies should continue, but it's an inescapable connection that what happens to you in childhood affects you in your development and across life into adulthood. Talk about neuroplasticity yeah. and the ability of the brain to really regenerate yeah. itself. Absolutely. I mean, neuroplasticity, uh, Michael Marusnik, who's here in the Bay Area, sort of uh, developed a lot of the science around that, and it's the brain that change, can change itself. But in order to change it, we have to be aware. There's a, a role for mindfulness and awareness of what I'm experiencing in my body, in the moment that I'm experiencing it, and then I can choose my response emotionally and begin to turn the effects of some of what happens to me. So I talked a lot about getting stuck in trauma is getting stuck a little bit in the past where you think a tiger's chasing you because maybe one did chase you when you were a child, but it's not chasing you, but you're reacting anyway like it is. That's an analogy that I'm using. If you're aware of that and you have awareness of your own body, you can start to turn and respond differently, and that actually changes the neural pathways in the brain. So the front, frontal, prefrontal cortex, where we have executive function, and the amygdala in the brain, which sort of is the fight or flight, get wired up differently under trauma. And through things like meditation, mindfulness, and that self-awareness process, they start to heal and become more regulated. Do you worry at all that mindfulness is becoming the watchword for cures and it also has become commoditized in some respects? I really worry about it. I mean, when I started talking about it, it wasn't actually all the rage. It's a good word, but it is, a, I think we can use interoception, which is a more formal word, but it's not as easy to say. But it's really presence. I mean, you know, it's actually a felt experience. It's not a conceptual idea. So I worry that a lot of people are talking about it and not really actually learning learning that it's actually an embodied capacity that we need to train for and keep learning over and over again. So I do worry a lot about that and would love to talk about the languaging so that it could really be more, more discussed at a public health level without triggering some of the reactions that the wording might have. You talked about six wishes for maternal and children's health. Mm -hmm. You talk about those, expand on that. Yeah, I mean, the first is to free our brilliance, because everywhere I go, whether I'm talking with pediatricians or policy leaders or parents or youth themselves, we have a sense that there's a lot that's possible. And then we start talking about why we don't do it. And a lot of it has to do with what we get paid for, what we got trained to do. We didn't get the training we needed to do things differently. We don't get incentivized to do it. There's not enough time in the waiting room, in the, in the visit room to talk about these things. So really to free our brilliance, we need to enable people to start behaving and acting differently that's more in alignment with what we know is needed and to reward them and train them and support them. And so if we're going to expect pediatricians to talk about these things in well visits or start to bring this into hospital care, we need to really create the structures and incentives that can allow that to happen. So that's the first one. The take on transparency is really, if we don't measure it, we don't know it. If we hadn't want measured what I presented today, we still wouldn't know it. So we have to t be more curious than afraid to get the feedback on what we're doing and how it's working, and including ourselves, like my feedback to myself. How did that go? And so that we can become learning machines. And the third is to what I call become we ninjas, which is to just acknowledge that we actually haven't really uh, figured out how to work well together in many ways. Even medical errors, when the root cause analyses are done, it comes down to communication among all the people in the team and that those are the biggest issues that uh, lead to medical errors. And it's the same thing in the community partnerships where we need sectors to work with each other, but they may not understand each other. And if they don't take the time to learn how to develop relationship, then we really don't end up implementing all of the um, benefits that we get from that. 
The fourth was prioritize possibility, and this is to really resource ourselves with strengths, to identify our assets and strengths no matter what's happened to you. There's more right with you than wrong with you and to know that it's possible to grow and change and that you have value and you have assets now is the safe place to then turn toward the trauma and start to work on healing it. But if we just focus on the trauma and the disease and the dysfunction, more of a disease model, we can re-traumatize ourselves and each other and we don't really end up focusing on promoting the positive. So if we just start promoting the positive, we're gonna be in the place where we can really effectively deal with and turn the tide on the, on the trauma. And the last part is to brave being, which is really my way of saying, you know, even in, in, in the world we live in, being overworked and crazed and not being able to focus very well is almost a status symbol. And yet we know that people who are in the position to work with children, teachers, parents, providers, doctors, are often very distracted and not present. And one of the key things that we know is needed to help regulate a child's emotions, let's say, who's been traumatized or who's not doing well, is presence and being able to really be there with them. And they can tell the difference. Their brains know and their bodies know. So the idea that adults really need to take on really cultivating their own well-being, healing their own trauma if they have it, I think is a key resource for being able to help children. How do you take these interventions and translate them and place them in areas around the world mm -hmm. that are war-torn, refugee camps, the great trauma that children are having from just displacement yeah. in the Middle East. How are they translatable? Well, we've had some great conversations here today, and in fact, the keynote speaker just now was talking about that. But I think one of the most important things is to go directly to the people in those areas and start engaging them about their experience and engage them in questions about what they think is possible. And every time I've done something like that, and it was also presented today, they know. And they start talking about what we're talking about, about the importance of safety and nurturance and respect. And that when that happens, we get very creative in solving the problems that might have a lot of need for structural change. But if people are feeling threatened, not listened to, and not engaged in their own help and the help that you want to give them, it often doesn't work, whether it's health behaviors, trying to get kids to lose weight, or whether it's a community in Africa, helping them you know, choose and change their own behavior to say do kangaroo care. This is really essential, that we can't avoid uh, really connecting with where people are at. So the engagement process, their engagement is what drives the change. And so how do we get really good at engaging ourselves and each other? And then I think we have so much brilliance, we can figure it out. We can figure out the structures and the pieces that need to come together, but if we're not engaged, all that conversation doesn't lead to sustainability. And that's what I think a lot of the findings are from the research. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks a lot.